Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 756, for the 2nd of April 2023. Richard Saunders coming to you from a soggy, wet, soggy, raining and sogging, sogging, Sydney, Australia. Coming up on this week's show, I talk to Kenny Biddle. Kenny Biddle, a man I've known for years but have never met. Never met. Kenny is the Chief Investigator for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, a CSI Fellow and host of the Skeptical Help Bar. And Skeptical Help Bar is a program I appeared on just the other day, live, uh, with Kenny. It was a video show, and we took questions. We had a great time. And I'll link to that uh, interview in this week's show notes. As the the rain pours down outside the Skeptic Zone studio, I hope the Skeptic Zone cats are okay. I think they're downstairs under a cardboard box. My interview with Kenny Biddle coming up at the top of the show. Following that, I take a peek into, and I have it right here, here it is, I take a peek into the latest issue of The Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, a little overview for those who subscribe, you'll know what to get when that magazine arrives in your letterbox, or by now you should have it in your uh, email inbox if you choose to get the digital version. The latest issue... The latest issue of The Skeptic magazine in review. Then we have a blast from the past, a real blast from the past. Way back in 1988, we hear a talk by the current challenge coordinator of Australian Skeptics, Ian Bryce, about the challenges, the psychic challenges presented to the skeptics all those years ago. Now, this is an old recording I found in the archives. It was on a cassette, and I ran it through a digital filter to remove the hiss and everything, so it cleans up pretty well. A fascinating peek into sceptical history. What were sceptics investigating, paranormal sense, in the paranormal sense, in 1988? And to round off the show, it's back to the Trove Archives where we look for ghosts. An oldie but a goodie. Ghosts in hospitals, I think, this time around. Haunted wards, haunted nurses, haunted doctors. When we visit the Trove Archives. Yes, the rain's pouring down. Oh, it stopped. But I must say, the well, you know what happened today? The clocks changed here in my part of the world. So we went back an hour, and the nights are starting to get colder, cooler, which means you don't have to sleep with a fan on and uh, trying to uh, keep cool. You can snuggle up under a, uh, a duvet or a doona or a decker or whatever you have, a nice blanket. Maybe... Maybe where you are, you have an electric blanket. I have very happy, fond memories of electric blankets. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, if you're in bed, if you're getting out of bed, if you're going for a walk, if you're on the bus, the train, the boat. Anybody listening to this on a boat, I wonder? Adrian Hill, I think. She's on a boat. I hope you enjoy the show. It's time for me to run downstairs and have a nice hot cup of soup. Chicken soup chicken noodle soup while I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Right now, it's Kenny Biddle. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Richard. How are you today? I'm very well. I'm very well because I just did a two-hour session on your show, your video show, we The did. Skeptical Help Bar. What can you tell our listeners about that? That is a live show that I do every Friday night. Um, Eastern time, it's 8 to 10 p.m. And it's basically it, there it, two versions. There's a, a, a version where I have a guest. Uh, like tonight with you, and we talk, we chat. The first hour, you and I chat, and we get to know the guest. We get to know what you do and what you're about and why you're on the show promoting usually science, skepticism, or something like that. 
And then the second hour is all up to the viewers where they get to ask you questions themselves. And we talk about different topics. And then the other version of the show is when I don't have a guest, usually because I've totally forgotten to try to book somebody. (laughs) And I find myself Friday afternoon going, oh, Uh -oh. no. Um, And then that's called open mic night. (laughs) Uh, Because the whole thing is, I mean, if you haven't gotten it, the whole thing is sit around like the local bar theme. So we, we, we have a good time. We just like have a couple of drinks and we talk about different topics and just casual conversation. So during open mic night, it's just me. And I open it up to the audience and just say, ask whatever you want. Um, if you want to, you can pop on to explain your question a little bit clearer and we'll look it up. And sometimes I share the screen and we Google stuff together and we learn, we learn and together. This is all part of the uh, CFI, of course, the, uh, the skeptical inquire presents. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I was doing the show before I was hired here full time, and then I brought it to them. And now, yes, now it's it's we broadcast live from Buffalo, New York, every every Friday. <laughs> How exciting! <laughs> now let's get into what you actually do. And you haven't been in this new position for very long, so where exactly are you? And what exactly do you do? <laughs> what am I what doing? Are you doing? So ex- I'm. Exactly in, so I'm in Buffalo, uh, New Buffalo, York, but yeah. it's Amherst. So the section is called Amherst and it's, it's right by the lakes that the, 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 oh my gosh, I, I've only been here since October. Um, and right now it's what the last day of March. Well, in your time, it's, it's the first day of April, but yeah. Um, so I've been up here for a couple of months. I'm still getting used to the area. Uh, but what I do, I am the chief investigator for the Committee for Skeptical Inquirer. So that means all of the weird stuff that happens in the world, whether it's ghosts, hauntings, cursed objects, Bigfoot, Loch Ness, monsters, um, UFOs, whatever, I get to investigate it. And yes, that is my full-time job. And I I love saying it. I can't <laughs> stop smiling when I say it because this is my dream job. Um, I get the research <laughs> all day long. I mean, yeah. whether reading books or articles or diving through the, the enormous reference materials that I got, which is called the Richard <laughs> Saunders collection um, yeah. that, that you sent me earlier. Um, I get to go through and just, I I solve mysteries. That's basically what my job is. I solve mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm your counterpart here in Australia. And as we were chatting about on the, uh, the the, uh, interview we just did, how could you possibly have a better job? We get to investigate the strange and the spooky and the mysterious and monsters and all that sort of stuff. I know. And, and not only that, but the, the best part, I guess, because I, I, I mean, mysteries are, I grew up with mysteries. I loved it. I, I watched In Search Of and Unsolved Mysteries growing up. These were the shows that I, you know, be, before VCRs, before <laughs> DVRs, before, you know, you everything was on demand 24-7. Yeah. You had to be sitting in front of that television at a certain time on a certain day yes. and, and to watch those programs. And that that was my religion back then. I needed to watch, I needed to see Leonard Nimoy tell me about some mystery. Yep. So not only do I get to, to investigate and for the most part, solve these mysteries, mm. but the, the added benefit is that I get to teach how I do things and, and teach critical thinking skills and about science and skepticism to the general public, but not the general public. That's not even the best part. It's when I get to go into classrooms, uh, either in person or via Zoom, and talk to kids and get their their minds excited about learning because you talk about ghosts and they're all like, ooh. And then, yeah. Well, I can identify with that exactly because I've been doing the Mystery Investigators School Show for uh, 20 years. Yes, that's yes, something. Yeah. I had that put on my list to talk about on, on my show, and I we, I just didn't get to it. But that, that sounds amazing. I, I would love to. It's exactly like what you're talking about. You go to the class and you kick off with monsters and ghosts and UFOs, and they're hooked. Yeah. Yeah. You've got them in the palm of your hand, and then you explain the physics behind fire walking and other things. So there you are. You're in the heartland of skeptical investigations. Now, you asked me during the interview what my background was. Is, is 
a similar story to you, I would imagine, how you got into this. Yes, I, like I like I said, uh, um, I grew up with those TV shows, and they've always—I don't know why it fascinated, but I, I did. Like I was so fascinated with these stories that there might be monsters. I'm a big sci-fi geek. I'm a comic book nerd, so all of these kind of stories just—that's what I was about. And to hear these monsters and ghost stories, and and even UFOs and aliens and all kinds of magic powers was fascinating. And when I grew up. And, and uh, I got married when I got married in 97, 1997, we got my wife and I got married and we bought ourselves a computer. And back then it was still pretty bad. You know, our first computer, I think the memory was like four megabytes or something. Probably. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> and the sales guy told us, you will never run out of space on this. <laughs> and because uh, that that's within like two months, I was like, I, I need more space. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. booked. But I started searching and realized that there were ghost hunting groups in my area that I could actually join. And it blew my mind. Like, Oh, I can actually go out and look, look for this stuff. So I did. That's what I did. I, I went out and it's almost embarrassing to say, but I was a ghost hunter for several years. I, I went out and I had those beliefs and um, I, I thought, you know, these little balls of light and photographs were ghosts and you could record them on your, your audio recorders. Back then we used uh, cassettes um, and now I, I went from cassettes to micro cassettes to now digital. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I know the story. I've got <laughs> mini DV tapes around here now. I can't do much yes. now, but now it's a uh, more uh, a digital I can. I still have shoe boxes of mini DV mini DV tapes. I have um, the 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 bigger. Um, I forget what they call not VHS tapes, but they were at the mid video eight or yeah. something high eight. I have the yeah. high eight. Yeah. yeah, I have all these tapes, and I still have the equipment. I I keep all that yeah. equipment in case I want to watch it. I never do because it's embarrassing the 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 stuff that I've said. Well, <laughs> you should digitize it and put it onto a chip like I did. Yes, and send it to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can have me. the Kenny Biddle files. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of the X files and the Saunders files. Now we've got the Biddle files. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, by the way, the session we just did, can, can uh, people see that? Yes, uh, it, it goes immediately to YouTube. So Excellent. if you go on to the YouTube channel, um, look for my name, Kenny Biddle, and it, it'll it come up. You'll see the channel and go to the live videos, and it's already there. It's already saved there. Excellent. Yeah. Well, there'll be a link in this week's show notes. But what we're saying is, well, apart, you know, skepticism is not just a dry academic uh, pursuit. We have so much fun. It's outrageous fun. Yes. And we get to do true investigation and adventures. Yeah, I, we have so much fun. We're not like, like you said. We're not these boring academics that you might think of when you say, "Oh, a bunch of skeptics get together and they skeptics, just, you know, yeah. they just debunk everything and they're <laughs> and grumble. Yeah, they're they're they yeah. they they're buzzkills. But we're not. We have so much fun and. I mean, just the last two hours that we've spent talking about and, and hearing stories and trading uh, stories and experiences was fun. I laughed a lot. I enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. even when I go to classrooms and talk to kids, it, it's not a boring thing. I never see anyone fall asleep. Yeah. When I when I do my lectures, no one is checking their phone, which is like that's a sure sign of whether you're doing good or not. <laughs> that's a good sign. We also learned the other trick about presenting to school children. Uh, occasionally, you throw candy. They love that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can get away with that here. Uh, <laughs> maybe not, yeah. maybe not, but we can still do it here. <laughs> Kenny, if people want to find out more, what's the best place they can head to? Uh, you can go to skepticalinquirer.org and look up my name, uh, Kenny Biddle. All of my work there, my my articles that I do for Skeptical Inquirer, both online and in the print magazine, are on there. I also do a video series for them called Ghosts in the Machine. And you do TikTok. And I do a TikTok, yes. You do a TikTok. I've, I've been watching I do a TikTok. TikTok. Same yeah. thing. You can look up my name, Kenny Biddle. And that is so much fun. I mean, people complain about TikTok, but I have a lot of fun. There are so many ridiculous 
ridiculous videos on yep. there. Yeah. But really bad. the fun part is trying to figure out how they do it. And I mean, some are so obviously bad too. I, yeah. it, it is, but some, some are very clever and it takes me a little bit like for uh, the people that are listening, can't see it. But if you look behind me, like on the shelf there, there's a teddy bear. Um, yep. And there was a video where this person said that portals, these magic portals were opening up in his house and this teddy bear got stuck halfway through a portal in his ceiling <laughs> and it was just stuck. It was half a bear. But then <laughs> later in the video, it pops out. There's a flash of light and it pops out and the teddy bears all whole, you know, and it, there's nothing ripped. And it, it took me a little bit to figure out what they did. There was no special effects. And basically all they did was they, they, it's because it's a stuffed, um, it's a plush toy. It's a plush bear, yeah. you know, and they yeah. just jammed, the legs up into the body <laughs> and squished it and then taped it up to the ceiling. And that's what I did. And, have, have you heard of a boo bear? A boo? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is the bear with a camera inside to catch right. paranormal activity. Oh my goodness. That, that's, that's spooky in itself, isn't it? That's pretty spooky. Yeah. Cause they also talk. They also, talk. I've I seen the ones that. Yeah, they, they say random phrases. And that's a big problem. Like I've had ghost hunters send me clips, video clips saying what's going on. We hear a voice and I hear the voice and it's, it's a distinct voice. Ooh. So as soon as I hear it, I say, well, do you have one of those boo bear things? Well, yeah, <laughs> but it was in the other room. Yeah, it was on. Wasn't it? Yes. Well, that's what you're, that's what you're recording. So yeah, <laughs> you got to be careful of those things. Again, folks, uh, uh, people like Kenny and myself have more fun. It's uh you know that expression, it's more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Every day. I, I am happy every day of my life right now. So <laughs> that, That's wonderful. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you for spending the last two hours with me. Again, folks, I'll put a link to that video in this week's show notes. And I had a great time because I pulled a whammy on Kenny with a bent spoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Kenny. Awesome. Thank you. Richard, how do I get better at telling if people are lying? It's really simple. What you need to do... A ghost's real. Well, actually, funny you should ask that, because what I've discovered... How do I improve my memory? I've got this great trick. Can you make me happier? OK, look, for answers to a thousand questions about the incredible world of human behaviour and the psychology of everyday life, join me, psychologist Richard Wiseman... And me, science journalist Marnie Chesterton... ...on Richard Wiseman's On Your Mind, a new podcast from Podimo and Telltale. Can I win the lottery? Probably not. Of course, every now and then on the Skeptic Zone podcast, we hear the book of Tim with Tim Mendham. In fact, I'm going to be visiting Tim, or he's going to be visiting the studios before long to record more Book of Tim, or is it Books of Tim, or is it Book of Tim's, something like that, where Tim Mendham dives back through the back issues of the Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics. Now... It's up to volume 43, number one, which means it's been going for 43 years, more or less. And I thought I would give a quick overview to you of the latest issue, because it is really one of the premier skeptical magazines in the world, and certainly one of the oldest. And here it is, right in front of me, The Skeptic. And the uh, cover has a, uh, a denim jacket with various skeptical pins. One says, I love skeptics. <laughs> I wonder where that was from. One is from Tam, Australia, all the way back there in 2010. I see the Bay Area Skeptics logo, Australian Skeptics logo, and a, another pin in the shape of a heart. I'm a skeptic, you know we're out there. Mm. And the headlines are, staying relevant, what skeptics need to do. And also in the issue, Psychic Tricks, Skepticon, which is coming up in Melbourne later this year, Exorcism, and Uri Geller on TV. Let's have a quick look through 
and see what we can see in the magazine. Well, the Skepticon on the back cover, there's a a uh, promotion for Skepticon, the Australian Skeptics National Convention, and this will be in December, December 2 to 3 this year, at the Brain Centre, University of Melbourne. Appropriate, really. And I'm sure we'll be hearing about uh, lots more about that during the course of the year. But opening up the magazine, let's have a look, let's have a look. An editorial by Tim Mendham called Preaching and Teaching. And then we have a round the trap, sort of a roundup of uh, sceptical news. There's an item about ivermectin still making the news. Another story about a Northern Territory court rejecting a sovereign citizen anti-vax appeal. A story about the conspiracy about COVID-19 being uh, leaked from a lab. What's this? Mexican president posts photo of an elf. Aha. Pete Evans spruiks expensive fasting retreat. Pete Evans still in the news. Hmm. Pay a lot of money to eat very little. And we have little tributes here to the late Harriet Hall and uh, Richard Buchon from uh, Queensland, a Queensland skeptic. Another story about Meryl Dory still in the news. It says here, Meryl Dory, the on-again, off-again president of the anti-vaccination group Australian Vaccination Risk Network, or is it risks? One of the other, uh, has made a bizarre online complaint about having to wear a mask in hospital. Oh dear, poor thing. A story about New Zealand cyclone and earthquakes not being engineered disasters? Well, I certainly hope not. UAPs gets a mention. Uh, Bandon. Worst peddler of misinformation, Russia claims psychic attacks. It's a bit out of date, isn't it? I mean, weren't they conducting psychic warfare way back in the 1970s or something like that? And a few other stories. The rest of the magazine is devoted to a review of the last convention, the last Australian Skeptics Convention, with a lineup of the speakers. Oh, my goodness me, there's a photograph of Brian Dunning. Oh, well. It takes all kinds, I suppose. I don't know. Oh, there's the ESP podcast too. They're a fine group of people. And uh, yes, every story, every uh, talk from the convention it gets a little uh, little review. A section called Readers Indigestible looks at some New Age magazines, including New Dawn, Fortean Times, and The History of Astrology. A feature by Claire Klingenberg about the way to go, the way ahead for skepticism. Then we have a feature from Tim Mendham about the search for relevance for the sceptical movement. A continuing feature on exorcism in Australia. Bizarre but true. A sceptical crossword. And then what's this? We have a large feature here by Susan Gerbeck. Susan Gerbeck explains how much information there is about you online and how psychics can access it. Psychic could have known it says. And it's a very interesting and really worth reading about how these people uh, trawl the internet, trawl your social media, looking for clues and photographs and documents and so on, uh, and then feed those back to you as if they're getting mystical insights. Very good research there by Susan Gerbeck. It's a lengthy feature and certainly one worth reading. Then we have a story about the time Yuri Geller was on TV here in Australia in 1987, so a good decade after his uh, initial first uh, fame and his confrontation with uh, magician Ben Harris. And Ben Harris actually wrote a book with the, or for the Australian Skeptics or published by the Australian Skeptics called Gellerism Revealed, which is like a uh, magic manual on how to bend keys and spoons, the Geller method. Hmm. And flipping through, we have more articles and features. So The Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics, again now in its uh, 43rd year, 42nd year. It first published in 1981. 1981. Now, all the back issues, bar the last four, are available free to download at skeptics.com.au. And you might uh, do what I do is I downloaded, or I download uh, the issues as they become available, and I put them into my iPad Books app. So I have all the back issues of the magazine 
with me at my fingertips for review or research or, or just reading the thousands of articles. The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics, you can subscribe uh, at skeptics.com.au. Have the recent, every new edition sent to you via email as a PDF and or, or and, you can uh, have the physical copy as well, which is a fine looking magazine. Okay, zebras, uh, orangutans. Oh, yes, sorry. Hi. I'm not used to the animals talking. Uh, Who are you? Yes, my name is Carrie Poppy. I co host a podcast called Ona Ross and Carrie. This is my co host, Ross, right here. Okay. We investigate spirituality, claims of the paranormal. And we were wondering if we could get on the ark. You did come two by two. I appreciate Thank that. You. Though most of the things I'm letting on the ark don't talk. I'm going to be talking all up on this boat. Do you mind both? I prefer ark. Or okay, barge. I'm not listening, but. If you let me on, mm -hmm. then I will make my really good podcast on your boat. Can you barge. at least help clean up all the poop? I guess I don't see why not. Well, I'll check out the podcast. Where do I find it? It's on MaximumFun.org. Skeptics around the world have been investigating mysteries and paranormal claims for, well, I guess it must be approaching something like 60 years. I thought we would take a trip back to the year 1988 and hear a presentation by Ian Bryce, who's currently, still currently, the, um, the uh, challenge coordinator here in Australia for the $100,000 prize. Way back then, something like 35 years ago, roughly, Ian Bryce spoke to the crowd about uh, some of the challenges that uh, have come the way or came the way of Australian skeptics when people were inquiring or trying to uh, win the cash prize on offer all the way back then in 1988. And uh, this is from an old archive I dug up, uh, an old cassette recording. And I've done my best to scrub it up, clean it up digitally. It's a little bit hit and miss here and there, but I think it's clear enough. But it's an insight into our history, into skeptical history. In 1988, this is the sort of thing, uh, when it came to paranormal challenges, Australian skeptics were dealing with. Take it away, 1988. Uh, without any further ado, we will go into the sessions. And our first speaker is... Um, Ian Bryce, who will tell us something about the challenges we've received from psychics, the official challenges uh, in which they seek to get our $20,000. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, Barry. Well, firstly, perhaps I can give you a little outline on the background of the challenge. As you probably will remember, Dick Smith uh, and James Randi got together back in 1981 and set up a water divining test involving an allotment of ground with pipes buried in in the ground uh, and water could be switched between them. Those tests were very well organised and well publicised in the media. Uh, as you know, those tests were not successful. Following that publicity, the Australian Skeptics was created and a number of interested people in Australia got together. And as you know, they've regularly published a magazine and researched a number of psychic claims uh, that actively investigated many of the claims which appeared in the media and which they heard of, and some of those carried through to the testing stage. And then around 1984, we decided to issue a formal challenge to psychics because the stream of psychics which were, which were coming to our attention was beginning to reduce a little. And we decided that this would be a printed set of rules by which the test would be done, and this would have the advantage that would be easily distributed, it would be widely reported in the media, which has been very successful. There was a large amount of money involved, figures like $100,000 for sure to attract a lot of interest. And it had some meat in it now, it was legally enforceable. Our patrons made a statement saying that the money was in fact available to anyone who could reliably demonstrate the psych event. And furthermore, it enabled us in our presentation to state categorically 
But despite the very large amount of reward money available, the worldwide figure is around half a million dollars, no psychic had ever been able to come up with a single psychic event demonstrated reliably. So that throws some of the responsibility onto the psychics and not just onto the sceptics who investigate them as they can. This can be regarded as a more active approach. So, how does our challenge work? The method has been based partly on the methods used by James Randi, and these methods have been modified by our own experience in Australia in carrying out our own tests. The aim, of course, the aim is to carry out the tests in a systematic, controlled and reliable manner. In other words, you carry out the tests in a way that will enable you to have confidence in the results. That's the sole aim. We've been criticised for the rules being too harsh, but their sole purpose is simply to make the results reliable and we can have confidence in them for the way they work out. There are a number of conditions set out on the piece of paper, which I'm sure most of you have seen. I'll just summarise them here. Firstly, the claimant should submit his or her claim in writing to the Australian sceptics. You'll be surprised at the number of people who have rung up saying verbally that they did this and that claim and can they please have the money. There have been some like that. So rather, we, we would like them to write it down in the proper letter, stating dates, times, and places, and so forth. There are a few matters of logistics here, just to streamline the procedures. One is that they, we ask they would get a reliable person, such as a teacher, police officer, perhaps either Queensland one, or public servant or so on, to witness the abyss is not legally binding in any way. It just helps to sort out those who have just invented something in their mind to try and uh, get around it. Now the protocol or the method of carrying out the test and analysing the results will be the result of discussion between us and the people claiming it and we must agree on a protocol before we can proceed further. As you will appreciate, it's entirely meaningless to carry out some tests and you're not sure how long they're going to take and when they're going to end. In the end of the tests you've got a success rate that's a 60 out of 100 or something that so therefore the threshold on which it is judged must be agreed by everyone beforehand. As far as costs go, we're not a profit organisation, so therefore the costs must of course be by the claimant. Although in practice, the members of the sceptics carrying out this have always given very generously of their time and resources to do so. And finally, whatever the result, Australian sceptics require that the results be properly recorded and will be published in the sceptic, whether they're favourable or not because that helps to eliminate a sort of selection process where the psychic researcher can carry out many different tests, select those few that get an above chance results and publish only those. We require that the results be published whether they're favourable or not. Of course, a responsibility comes with this. Firstly, we're responsible to our two patrons, Dick Smith and Philip Adams, for the $10,000 that they've put up as of the prize stands at the moment. And secondly, we're also responsible, of course, to the people submitting the test. The last thing we would want to do would be to reject some phenomenon and then find out that it was genuine, that would put us in a deadly embarrassing situation. So therefore, we uh, enlist the help of consultants. There are, there are many professional scientists and so forth among our members, and we freely uh, consult with those on the proper ways of carrying out tests. Secondly, we must fully appreciate the risk of getting a positive result by chance. There's always a, a risk, of course, that if you toss a coin and you, know, you will get nine, 99 uh, hits out of 100 shots. And you must fully appreciate the statistics involved. So we're fully aware that there is a small chance that a positive result can arise by chance. And thirdly, it hasn't happened yet, but it's conceivable that someone will come along and try to trick the Australian sceptics out of their money. There was such a case of that in Britain, where James Randi went over and examined the apparatus they were using and found a couple of slight defects in the design which enabled them to bias the results. So, therefore, to guard against the possibility of someone deliberately and maliciously trying to trick the Australian sceptics out of the money, we enlist the help of quite a few magicians who are very capable of spotting such things. So the, I'll just briefly discuss the 14 challenges that we've had since, the, since we began uh, carrying out the, the National Committee in Sydney three years ago. 
of those 14 people who have written a properly documented claim in writing, we find there's a heavy preponderance of water diviners. There are four people who claim to be able to find underground water, and most of those produced documentation from a farmer or someone else saying that successfully found water. One person claimed to be able to douse for water from an aircraft, and another one claimed to be able to find water by divining on a map. That's very, that saves a lot of shoe leather, of course, if you can just sit down in the camp of your home, lay out a map on the table to find out where the, where the water is. Or, or one of the applicants was, uh, showed us some very good information. The CSIRO has two electromagnetic devices for finding water or mineral deposits underground. So he drew our attention to these and we approached the CSIRO and obtained the documentation on these two instruments. And unfortunately, one of them is referred to as the CFIRO's new water and or salt diviner. So that's the most embarrassing choice of words there. We've had some people saying, there you are, the CSIRO knows how they can divine water. Why do you say that we... No. So that's been a bit of an embarrassment. Of course, we're fully aware of the electromagnetic properties of the CSIRO's instruments and how they work. And there's certainly no resemblance between that and how the diviners operate. Another applicant was able to divine minerals. Another applicant uh, told us how very large amount of detail how he predicted the supernova would occur. And uh, he said that he was visited by various intergalactic and paranormal bodies and informed of these facts. And he wrote about it to us sometime after the event and claimed that he'd in fact predicted it before the event. So we wrote back to him and said that if Commander Michael of the Star Fleet should favour him with any more predictions, he should perhaps drop a line to the sceptics before the event this time. That really strengthens the case if he tells us about it beforehand. We had a lady who could read tea leaves. We asked her for <coughs> supporting evidence for her tea leaf reading and she sent us some documentation, the book she'd written and a major advanced thesis. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't, none of our scientists have yet been able to understand it, but we're working on that one. We have a practitioner of iridology who claims to be able to prove that there is in fact a connection between the iris of the eye and the organs of the body. We've got people who can claim to be able to carry out hands-on healing. We've got people who can carry out telekinesis and telepathy. We've got a spiritualist called Bill Backer from South Australia who was rather threatening in his manner and uh, received some media attention for his claims to be able to uncover the murderer who murdered a lady in South Australia. Unfortunately, he's since fallen into the hands of the police. I'm not sure what's happening there, but that, I think that we can probably close that file. We had a very versatile person who applied with paranormal flames. We asked him to identify the paranormal flame there Flaming. It says paranormal powers flamed. Mark, which ones? Clairvoyance, telepathy, telekinesis, levitation, mediumship, astrology, other psychic predictions, psychic surgery, water or metal divining, ESP and all other. And as Barry mentioned before, he wrote all of the above. So you've got to give him some prizes for trying there. Finally, we had a claimant who claimed to be able to decipher the quatrains of Nostradamus and that that would point to the identity of the base on Mars. So out of those 14, unfortunately none of them have progressed for the stage of testing. I'm not quite sure why that is, but our, perhaps our rules are doing their job, but we would certainly have liked to carry out some testing on them. Finally, there was one case where we did carry out some testing, and that's where a group called Harmony Health Products gave us some little devices that they call the polarizer. There's one type you put on your water pipe and it purifies the water that comes out. Another type you put on the terminal of your battery and it makes your car run better and less vibration and save petrol and all that. I think that followed on after the publicity that was given to Peter Brock's polarizer. These people approached us and asked us to carry out some testing to confirm that their devices worked and give it an endorsement. Well, <laughs> It was with great relish that we, in fact, carried out very detailed testing on this device. We have a scientific report that studies in detail the many planes, uh, all of them negative, I'm afraid, and uh, it's being prepared for 
publication and a future skeptic. Thanks very much. from the Data Skeptic Podcast. If you're curious about the way data is changing our world, topics like AI and all this craziness with Facebook and bots and the Twitter storm and how the algorithms that underline that work, uh, and you don't want a technical deep dive, you want it you know, in the vernacular in a way that people can understand, check us out at Data Skeptic. That's what we try and do. I interview advanced professionals in the field who do this sort of research, and then I get into interesting projects as well. We're a weekly show, and you can find us at dataskeptic.com. Now it's time once again to peer into those archives at Trove, the online resource of digitized newspapers going back many decades into centuries from Australia. Australian digitized newspapers, magazines, and so on, fully searchable at trove.nla.gov.au. Give it a visit. Give it a visit. It's a fascinating resource for our history. Now, in keeping up with our general paranormal theme, once more, once more, we're going to rattle the uh, the cages and see if we can scare up some ghosts. Ghosts from the past. You know, it must be very boring being a ghost waiting for decades or centuries for somebody to happen across your crypt or your room or your wherever you are, only to scare them. Maybe not the most fulfilling of existence. So we turn to the pages of the Bulletin magazine, which I, I'm sure no longer exists, from April the 1st, <laughs> April the 1st, 1980, and a report by Greg Sheardon under the title of The Supernatural, Hospital Ghosts Show Up as Friendly Spirits. In these days of the Amityville horror, aliens from outer space and spooks and spookiness generally it is reassuring to know that some ghosts are benevolent. Australia's hospitals boast a rich harvest of ghosts, as well they might, hospitals being rather obvious places for ghosts to congregate. The most interesting of the hospital ghosts inhabits St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, or, more peculiarly, Ward 14. The famous Alcoholics Ward, where many of Sydney's most hopeless soaks have some solace. There are stories that some of the patients have been consoled and comforted by the mysterious, quote, grey nun, end quote, who apparently inhabits an old lift in the ward. Nurses and staff on the night shift won't use that particular lift, and stories about the grey nun are legion. She is supposed to have fallen down a stairwell many years ago and has been a friendly and occasional visitor to the ward ever since. Apparently, the floor of the ward is now a few centimetres higher than it was when she walked the rounds, and so her feet are never visible. Just the black stockings below the grey uniform. Dr. Ron Spencer, medical superintendent of St. Vincent's, explained that some of the people who have had experience with the Grey Nun are reluctant to speak about them because they feel their relationship with her is a very private and personal thing. They also feel they might be ridiculed by their professional colleagues. He says, Some of the nurses at the hospital spoke to the Bulletin about the Grey Nun, but none wanted their names mentioned. They recounted several stories of encounters with the mysterious ghost. On one night shift, a nurse felt an overwhelming sense of another presence near her. She called out to the sister on duty, who came to see what was the matter. 
The sister also felt the presence and said to the grey nun, Go down to the other end of the ward. That's where you're wanted. About 30 seconds later, the nurse at the other end of the ward, where the grey nun had been directed, called out to the sister. She now felt the presence of the nun. On various occasions, patients have been seen talking with no one in sight. When asked, they have said they were talking to, quote, the lady in grey, end quote. On another occasion, a nurse saw a nun dressed in grey walk through the ward about 4 a.m. The next day, she commented to one of the hospital nuns about the odd hours some of them kept. But on inquiry, no sister had been out that night. There are even stories, though most nurses don't believe them, of the grey nun fixing patients' drips. All the nurses emphasise that the grey nun is a benevolent spirit who never causes any trouble, but will comfort patients and generally be helpful. St Vincent's spookiness doesn't end with the grey nun, however. Apparently, a hanging light in a certain ward swings only when a death is imminent. The historic Sydney Hospital has its share of ghostliness as well. The 180-year-old hospital in Macquarie Street is a perfect setting for ghosts. The weathered sandstone and old grey buildings might have been specially constructed as a poltergeist paradise with narrow corridors and dark corners in abundance. In what was once the Rum Hospital, there have been quite a few rum events in recent years, with until recently two ghosts being spotted by the old hospital. Sister Suzanne Lewis, a senior member of the nursing staff at Sydney Hospital, readily admits that she believes in the reality of ghosts at Sydney Hospital. She says, Staff have constantly reported in a particular ward sounds of footsteps and they've seen a shadow of somebody in a cloud, but never seen the face. It's near the pan room that they've usually seen it, mainly at night. It's been going on for quite some years. A nurse is supposed to have hung herself in that same pan room around the turn of the century. Sister Lewis says that the presence of the ghost sometimes upsets the young nurses, but it doesn't worry the more experienced ones as much, because they know the ghost is friendly. Sydney Hospital's other ghost was a junior doctor who, many years ago, threw himself off the top of one of the buildings. An old lift in the building, which could only be opened manually by a rope, used to go up and down of its own volition, and sightings of unexplained shadows in the lift were sometimes reported. About four or five years ago, the lift was replaced, and no further incidents were reported. Casual inquiry also reveals that Royal Brisbane Hospital also has its resident ghost. A woman in white has reportedly kept a visual beside patients' beds in Ward 15. Patients have reported sightings at night, and some of them even thanked duty nurses for attending their beds, but then found no nurse was near them. Spooky goings-on at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney way back in the 1980s. And there's a photograph of the hospital here. Sydney St. Vincent Hospital. The ghost of a nun does the rounds occasionally in Ward 14. I wonder, I wonder if Ward 14 still exists. And finally, we'll turn to the Blue Mountains Gazette, dated the 2nd of December, 1904. Indignant ghosts. Two, quote, ghosts, end quote, who were captured at a spiritualistic seance in Brooklyn, USA, purportedly demanded the arrest of their captors for assault and battery. The seance was coordinated by two mediums of considerable local repute and was attended by a large gathering of the public as the materialization of an angel child and an Indian chief had been promised. The audience sat for a long time in darkness, in the hope that the spirits would show themselves, and soft music was played to give an agreeable reception. Initially, two shadowy outlines appeared. One was in the likeness of an Indian chief, but the angel child had materialized into an adult female form. Very strange. At the same moment, there was a mysterious rush in the audience. 
and the female ghost set up heart-rendering shrieks. The Indian chief contributed his quota to the noise by pouring out a torrent of abuse. Then the lights were turned on, and the materialized spirits were seen to be in the hands of a couple of unbelievers who called in the police and had them arrested as impostors. The angel brought against her captor a charge of assault by pulling out her hair, while the Indian chief added larceny to the assault charge by alleging that his red coat was stolen. (laughs) What what a strange account of a seance way back in 1904 in Brooklyn. Now, in my um, searching through Trove, and when I think about it, of all the terms I look up for this segment, dealing with the supernatural and the paranormal and uh, old medicine, skeptical stuff in general, I think the most returns probably can be found when you type in the word ghost. There are many indeed. But of course, when you uh, go to Trove and have a look around, you never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast this week. And thank you to Kenny Biddle. I had a wonderful time uh, chatting to uh, to Kenny. And again, you can see that whole interview. It's uh, on YouTube and in this week's show notes. And thank you to those people who have recently come on board to support the Skeptic Zone at Patreon or PayPal. Much appreciated, much needed. It means the show can keep going. And uh, you can do that. You can join the throng of people who <laughs> help the Skeptic Zone by visiting skepticzone.tv. But for this week, with the, oh, it stopped again. That's really weird. It, the showers are just coming and going. With the rain stopping and starting, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Another thing. That's all coming up, but I thought we'd take a moment for the Easter egg. This is for all the people who listen after the music. Easter is coming up. Easter is coming up. We got the Easter egg in today's episode of the Skeptic Zone podcast. I'm with the trivia team, the trivia crew in Susan Gobick's Weekly Trivia. I've got a 10-sided blurry die there because it's blurring out a little bit on the scene. There we go. Okay. How many fives are on that? One. There's only one five. Folks, uh, chip in with into the chat with your guests. We're going to roll it three times. I'm going to unblur my screen so you can see it properly and see if you can guess... But the dice comes up. We got okay. a three, a four, a one, an eight, a five, a three, a it's five. It's a five. It's going to be five. I, I'm saying it verbally. Nobody's put in eleven or twelve yet. That's a good thing. Here we go. And you'll have to take my word. Pie. For it. I think pie. I, 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 you put pie, and that's not fair. Pie. All right. Roll number one. I didn't eight. Hear. I didn't eight. hear it. Did. did well, Number I know eight. you showed me an eight, but I didn't see any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You skeptics. Number eight was the first roll. Here we go. Roll number two. Put in your I, guesses now. Did anybody get eight? Somebody did. Yes, somebody did get eight. Three. We've got a one, a nine, a four from Rob. And here it comes. Roll number two. 
A six from Karen. There we go. Uh, Roll number two is eight. <laughs> oh, no. That's what I'm uh, Eight. I got Something an eight. This... Susan, you know it's going to happen every now and then. Okay. Five. Last roll. Here we go. The last time. Here five. it comes. Come on, five. Mama needs new shoes. Three, five, eight, seven, four, five, seven. And it is a seven. Oh, Ooh, right. I don't got that. <laughs> Caroline, I think, said that. I Today's did winning numbers for you at home. If you're playing seven. along, eight, eight, and seven. And Susan, I noticed that... Uh, on uh, TikTok, you've been putting up something to do with a seatbelt psychic. Oh, he is going, the seatbelt psychic, Thomas John, he has gone viral. Millions of views on these on these things, and it's incredible. And then we looked, he's sponsoring some of these. He's paying for these ads for other people to put them up on their TikTok channels. So, well, Susan, I think that's a topic we can discuss in an upcoming episode of The Skeptic Zone. But thank you, everybody, for playing the dice you. game this week. I love that stuff. No fives, but 